Welcome to a very special occasion that we've been looking forward to for a long time. And there are many people here who have made this afternoon possible, and we will look forward to saluting them and thanking them at various stages across the next few parts of this program. But it's my pleasure as chair of the Keenan Institute for Ethics Advisory Board to welcome you here for the Keenan Lecture for the year 2001. This is, as I think most of you are aware, a series that brings distinguished speakers to our campus to address ethical issues of broad social and cultural significance. We have had some very distinguished lecturers in this series, and all of us who've been able to hear the several ones would attest that there is a building sense of uh, a sort of expertise and thoughtfulness in addressing the crucial issues that are within the mission of the Keenan Institute. Today's talk is of special significance because it marks a very important turning point. I think everyone in this room is aware that in 1995, the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust awarded a five-year planning grant to Duke University to develop a program in ethics that would both permeate the life of our campus but also reach beyond our walls. I think we were all unsure at that time exactly what might come of such a venture, but many of us were very excited about it, no one more so than Frank Keenan himself who had a vision of what this might be that inspired all of us, even in times when we were not quite sure that we would be able to follow it. Since then, under the leadership first of Tommy Langford as interim director, and now, of course, as Elizabeth Keish as our wonderful founding director, the Keenan Ethics Program over these five years has grown from strength to strength, promoting ethics across our curriculum and in everyday campus life, permeating discussions and conversations and formal curricula at Duke and elsewhere, but also beginning to make a significant impact across not only our region and our state, but our nation and even our world in a broad range of partnerships with our larger community. So last year, after evaluating our five-year efforts, the Keenan Trust voted to create a $10 million endowed fund called the William R. Keenan Jr. Fund for Ethics and to promote the Keenan Ethics Program to the rank of a Keenan Institute, parallel to three other such institutes at our colleague institutions in our state, which focus on the arts, on engineering, science, and technology, and on private enterprise. Now, we are deeply grateful to the Keenan Trust and to the fund for their generous support and we're honored to welcome here today representatives of the Keenan family, members of the board of the Keenan Trust, and also the fund's leadership. And I will mention at this point only a few and introduce and thank others later. Most of all, Betty Keenan, who is chair of the William R. Keenan Jr. Fund for Ethics. Betty, if you would stand and let us salute you and thank you. And Richard Krasno, who is Executive Director of the Keenan Trust and President of the Keenan Funds. Dick, welcome. <laughs> As we celebrate the formal launch of the Keenan Institute, it is fitting that we pause to consider more deeply and critically the moral dimensions of our mission as educators. In Duke University's own strategic plan in 1994, we affirmed a commitment to attend not only to students' intellectual growth, but also their, to their development, quote, as adults committed to high ethical standards and full participation as, le as leaders of their communities, and also, quote, to prepare future members of the learned professions for lives of skilled and ethical service. We have deliberately reaffirmed those commitments in the current version of our strategic plan that we will take to our Board of Trustees formally next month with their full support. So we see the development of wisdom about ethics as a major responsibility for Duke and a major distinguishing characteristic of our university, given our historical commitment to the education of the spirit as well as of the mind. We've made a lot of progress recently, but there's still much more work to be done. The newly minted plan that the board we hope will approve next month will give even more currency to today's discussions. So given this promising start and bright future, we are very fortunate to have with us today for the 2001 Keenan Lecture, one of our country's most dedicated, thoughtful, and effective advocates of the ethical mission of higher education, and an old friend to a number of us in this gathering, Tom Ehrlich. Tom knows Duke well, even though he has never spent 
quite as much time sustained here as he has at a number of sister institutions, but he has visited us, befriended us, counseled us, and we are very pleased to have him back. Descartes reminded us almost 400 years ago that it is not enough to have a good mind. The main thing is to use it well. Tom Ehrlich has got such a mind, and he uses it, as you will soon learn if you are not already familiar with his groundbreaking work. Let me invite the director of the Keenan Institute for Ethics, Elizabeth Keish, to introduce our speaker. Elizabeth. Thank you, Nan, and uh, thank all of, I want to thank all of you for coming here. It's a wonderful occasion and a very exciting one in the life of our institute, and I think in the life of Duke University as well. And I'm just delighted that Tom Ehrlich is here to be our Keenan lecturer this year. When I first came across the report that he wrote with his colleague Ann Colby at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching about uh, promoting undergraduate moral and civic responsibility, it produced a kind of epiphany for me um, because I felt like here was someone who was thinking deeply about the enterprise of moral education and of education more generally but also thinking systematically across the institutional range of American higher education, which is, of course, unique in the world. Large institutions, small institutions, faith-based institutions, secular institutions, and thinking about the many, many different ways in which institutions are trying to promote moral and civic responsibility, the different obstacles they face, the different best practices we might identify. And the, the spirit and the vision in that, in that paper was just so exciting and very much um, uh, at the heart, I, I think, of, of our mission with the Keenan Institute for Ethics. So I was then delighted to get the opportunity to meet Tom. I consider him one of my most important mentors in this, in this field, and I'm just delighted that we get an opportunity uh, to hear from him. He is, uh, has a, a distinguished career in, in higher education. He's a, a graduate of Harvard University and Harvard Law School. He has been, among many other positions, he has served as provost of the University of Pennsylvania, Dean of Stanford Law School and President of Indiana University. He's currently a distinguished university scholar at California State University and is uh, with his colleague Ann Colby co-directing a national project at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, which as I said is looking at what American colleges and universities are doing, can be doing, and should be doing to promote student moral and civic responsibility. He's also the chair-elect of the American Association of Higher Education. He um, has been at Duke before, as, as Nan mentioned, and uh, I very much look forward to hearing his wisdom today. And I would very much recommend to you uh, some of the books that he's written, in particular, The Courage to Inquire and Higher Education and Civic Responsibility. Today he'll be talking about something that is truly at the heart of the mission of the Keenan Institute for Ethics, moral and civic learning. So please join me in welcoming Tom Rolish. Thank you uh, both, uh, good, good friends. It's a special pleasure uh, to be here to join you in applauding uh, the Keenan Center and uh, in applauding those who made this great day uh, uh, possible. I am uh, confident, absolutely confident, that in the years ahead the Center will continue to be a model, a model of the kind of focused inquiry on the most important issues that we face as human beings what are our core values and uh, how should we live by those values? Those are the questions that it's been attending to to date successfully and it will be in the future. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, I did have the pleasure six years ago of being a visitor here for a semester. I had just left Indiana University. I was writing a book on which I was trying to reflect on lessons learned after some 30 years of grazing in the fields of higher education. Uh, one of those lessons, uh, perhaps uh, the most important, was a troubled sense that American higher education had lost its way in terms of moral and civic learning. But I was struck then, struck, uh, uh, I remember, uh, very much so by the determination of your president and by many of those with whom I spoke to make uh, Duke an exception. In the intervening years, she and you have done just that, and I applaud your work. At the same time, I do have a sense of urgency that has increased, a growing concern that Americans do not feel 
responsible for or accountable to each other, and that the rampant self-interest that's preeminent over concerns for the common good has, uh, has um, dominated our culture in too many dimensions. Goals of personal advancement and gratification uh, dominate our culture. It's too often about me, not often enough about us. And I'm particularly troubled that those forces in society are pressing higher education to promote individualism over community. The competitive commercial pressures to view students as customers, to respond to their vocational demands have led many campuses to promote their functions as enablers of personal advancement rather than as conveners for the common good. In response to students' career interests, uh, campuses react with all the personalized attention of a boutique, all the mass delivery uh, technique of an ATM machine. And higher education also, too often today, is about me and not about us. Well, did higher education once uh, really serve a convening function? Did it really help our society understand and strengthen common moral and civic bonds? Nostalgia for the good old days is a dangerous pastime. Uh, they never were quite as good as, uh, as we remember. But I do think that there has been a corrosion of the sense among institutions of higher education that they have a common mission to improve society as a whole. Perhaps more, more important, I think this is a critical time for higher education generally and for research universities like this one particularly to take the lead in reaffirming our moral and our civic purposes, purposes that were articulated uh, by President Cohen just moments ago. We have opportunities and we have obligations to cultivate in our graduates an appreciation for moral responsibility, for civic engagement, as well as to foster those capabilities and capacities necessary for thoughtful discourse and participation in matters of moral and civic concern. And that's, of course, what I'd like to discuss with you today. Through a project at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, as uh, you gathered, uh, several colleagues and I are analyzing the American undergraduate scene in terms of campus efforts to promote moral and civic learning. We're also working hard to try to encourage colleges and universities across the country to strengthen those efforts. Our project is studying a small group of institutions as models of good practice, and I'm pleased to say that Duke is one of those groups. Our focus is on both moral and civic learning because we do believe the two are inseparable. America's democratic principles, including tolerance, respect for others, procedural impartiality, concerns for the right of the individual, the welfare of the group, are all grounded in moral principles. And likewise, the problems that civically engaged citizens must confront always have moral dimensions. Fair access to resources such as housing, the moral obligation to consider future generations in terms of making environmental policy, the conflicting claims of multiple stakeholders and community decision making. None of those issues and many more could be adequately resolved without deep consideration of moral questions. A person can, of course, be civically and politically active without good judgment, without a strong moral compass. We don't have to look further than the White House to know that. But it's hardly wise to promote that kind of involvement. And because civic responsibility is inescapably threaded with moral values, we believe that higher education must aspire to both moral and civic maturity and must confront educationally the many links between them. We recognize very well the difficulties, the potential pitfalls that educators face when discussing moral and civic values in a society that's as strongly pluralistic as our own in which tolerance and respect for difference are held as fundamental values in and of themselves. We believe that pluralism, democratic pluralism, shouldn't be equated with moral skepticism or relativism, but rather with an ongoing moral discourse in which citizens are encouraged to express, to revise, to refine their own ethical commitments. 
Relativism undermines democracy if all values are seen merely as expressions of personal preference with no interest in engaging in deep dialogue about the reasons for holding a particular view or its ability to withstand thoughtful criticism. Too often, I fear, those of us in higher education have allowed radical crusaders on the left and on the right to hijack even the terms values or moral in our efforts to avoid their litmus test. And we fail to stake out the ground explored by Aristotle and again earlier in this century by Dewey and more recently by thoughtful analysis, analysts such as McIntyre. Each generation needs, of course, to re-engage in that process for itself, for the circumstances of the day. But too often, I fear, those of us in the academy aren't giving much help. Too often, those in philosophy, even those who admit to the validity of inquiry outside the analytic realm, focus exclusively on technique and critique, the two reasons why Plato is inadequate, the three faults of Kant, the four failings of Rawls, and the faculty, those faculty view their roles as analysts and as observers, but not as coaches of their students in the process of developing their own moral judgments. And it's no wonder, I think, that they emerge from their classes, or many of them, as relativists at best, as cynics at worst. And I too frequently hear that same set of concerns about courses in political science where students gain the equipment to criticize but not to engage wisely and actively in civic affairs. Most obviously this is true for all faculty in relation to the moral virtue of academic integrity, of not cheating, which is at the heart of a, how a university operates and should be the responsibility of every single faculty member as much as every single student as members of a common campus community. But unfortunately, on most campuses, too few faculty view it that way. Those of us who teach materials that particularly lend themselves to, to raising moral and civic issues, I think have a special obligation to do so in ways that help students wrestle with their own moral and civic dilemmas, as well as with the larger social and political concerns. It's just not enough to show that by reason any moral framework can be criticized, but rather we must take on that much more difficult task of helping students think through for themselves which moral perspective is best able to answer their intellectual, their personal, their social needs. And moral inculcation, of course, is not what I have in mind. That is the province of the pulpit. But like Socrates and Thoreau, we ought to expect our students to avoid the unexamined life. And to do that requires not only intellectual virtues, but moral and civic virtues as well. And we as teachers need to provide multiple opportunities for our students to consider values in the context of their own actions or inactions. And the social sciences and the natural sciences have very important contributions to make to those processes, though they may seem less obvious at first than those in the humanities. Our Carnegie project has revealed many, many ways in which issues of moral and civic responsibility are dir directly addressed in fields such as engineering, biology, and economics, domains that are too often viewed as value-free or morally neutral. Although many colleges and universities have made serious commitments to moral and civic learning, most have focused on particular programs or special activities that do not affect most of their undergraduates. Uh, and they certainly don't try to coordinate their efforts uh, in those programs. But in contrast, a relatively few colleges and universities have made broad institutional commitments to seeking to develop all students' moral and civic uh, character, and Duke is one of those. In my experience, it is among those in the lead in research universities, a number of others, universities of Michigan, Minnesota, Maryland, Emory and Tufts, for example, also have taken, uh, undertaken major efforts, though none have done the dramatic uh, and extensive revision of the entire curriculum for general education to the extent uh, that Duke has. In the Carnegie Project, we sought to document the work of some of these campus models of, of good practice, and they do share, however unevenly, some institutional features that you, I hope, will see reflected right here at Duke. 
the first is that their school's public statements of institutional purpose stress the importance of personal integrity, social responsibility, civic and political engagement. Second, the president particularly and upper levels of the administration generally in both academic and student affairs endorse the importance of those educational goals. They allot resources to them. Third, there are multiple overlapping but integrated approaches used in each setting uh, and there are mechanisms in place to facilitate communications among the programs to strengthen the coherence. You're fortunate here in the leadership of President Cohane, and I do recall uh, strengthening Duke's sense of community and its role of, as a citizen was one of her strategic themes set early in her tenure. Your faculty gave strong support to the important requirement that all students take at least two courses in ethical inquiry as part of the general education to the integration of ethical inquiry into much of the first year writing program. Although the campuses we've been looking at are a very diverse group, uh, represent a range of unique adaptations to a common task, they also share a number of assumptions, programmatic elements, and certainly challenges. In particular, they all address the cognitive or the intellectual dimensions of moral and civic development and seek to connect general capacities for sophisticated judgment with substantive issues of real moral significance. And they also all try to create a common culture of concern for moral issues. They offer opportunities for engagement, and they provide means for helping students to shape their own moral and civic identities. For most cam campuses, as at Duke, integration was deliberately planned as part of the curriculum. Consideration of the moral, the civic, the political issues in coursework was often tied to efforts to promote critical thinking and effective communication, as in your first year writing program, recognized as an important part of civic discourse. Most of the campuses we visited had centers of teaching and learning that helped with curricular development, as yours did, sponsored active programs for interdisciplinary study and faculty reading groups, uh, in addition, service learning, as here, is uh, a powerful pedagogy, I think the most powerful pedagogy of engagement, particularly when it's used in collaboration with uh, problem-based learning and, and uh, cooperative or collaborative uh, learning. The idea behind service learning, as I hope you know, is that academic learning can be linked to community service through structured reflection so that each enriches and enhances the other. Service learning courses are now offered at virtually every college and university in the country, cover almost every academic discipline in the sciences, social sciences, humanities, and, and professions. Some of the schools we visit require at least one service learning experience. Many more encourage, though they don't inquire it. All of the campuses we've visited uh, would underscore that uh, the work they are doing in the realms of moral and civic learning are very much works in progress, as those I've talked with today would say about their work at, at Duke, developing courses and programs that are both intellectually rigorous and personally transformative is very difficult, as Elizabeth Keish and her colleagues at the Keenan Center well know. And the programs that we've seen both within campuses and working between campuses varied a good deal in the extent to which they're really able to achieve those goals and they're being revised over time. Assessment is a key tool. We found a number of places that have uh, quite clearly defined outcomes in the realm of moral and civic learning and quite detailed approaches for assessing uh, those outcomes, more, I think, than, than you do uh, here at Duke. We've also seen um, a substantial growth in efforts to coordinate and link work among campuses. A Campus Compact, an organization now of 650 college and university presidents, has been particularly successful in this realm. Uh, just two years ago, the presidents of about 75 institutions uh, came together over the 4th of July uh, and issued a powerful challenge to uh, themselves to enhance the civic engagement of their students and their campuses and spelled out in considerable detail in an assessment document how they proposed to go about doing that. Since then, that challenge has been signed by some 350 
uh, presidents of colleges and universities across the country, and many of them have made significant progress uh, toward their goals. Our own Carnegie project is certainly um, uh, far from over, but I might summarize some of the key themes that have emerged uh, from it with examples drawn from the campuses we visited. Uh, and I'll try to use campuses that have dimensions other than those at, camp at, at Duke just to illustrate the differences and the diversity. The first uh, theme certainly is that moral and civic learning are inexorably interconnected so that any activity that focuses on civic responsibility ought to focus directly on moral and ethical issues as well. I'll illustrate uh, with a campus that might surprise you, uh, Turtle Mountain Community College in Belcourt, North Dakota. Uh, the site of this college will take your breath away uh, if you're lucky enough to see it. It's housed in a single building in Turtle Mountain, Chippewa Reservation, which is snuggled right up against the Canadian border. Uh, in northern North Dakota. The college itself looks like a giant thunderbird. At its center, a large steel columns leaning inward uh, toward each other uh, jut through an open space in the manner of enormous poles of a, in a teepee. And the space was designed to suggest the traditions of Chippewa life. There's a huge window at the top of the building supported by columns, and from the outside, uh, this tinted window appears to be the back of a turtle, the, the special symbol of the tribe. And inside, the light from the window illuminates the space below, and there is a giant medicine wheel incorporating traditional Chippewa colors. Uh, and throughout the building, the themes, the colors, uh, all reflect tribal traditions and uh, tribal teachings. It's sited right on the top of a hill, and there's a very impressive entrance to, uh, to the single building, which is the college, where there are a set of seven columns set in a semicircular. And each column is inscribed with one of the seven key teachings central to the tribe. And none of these uh, teachings will, will strike you as um, different from many of the teachings uh, that uh, are, emerge from many other uh, traditions or faiths uh, about respect and caring for each other, uh, but the power of seeing them as you walk in the door. Uh, and then there's scores and scores of activities uh, inside the building to enhance the moral and civic responsibility of students rooted in those teachings. And they infuse not just the curricular, but the co-curricular programs. Here's a college uh, devoted to uh, service in the community, to integrating tribal culture into all dimensions of learning to the extent that uh, there is a mandate that every course has to have some dimension of tribal culture in it. And it isn't as though they could just turn to a book and find that culture. They really had to, to uh, dig deeply and widely to recreate the, the bits and pieces of the culture and put it back together again as part of their learning process. A second uh, theme uh, that has struck us is that uh, a comprehensive program for moral and civic development needs to address both the intellectual dimensions and the dimensions that affect motivation, commitment, such as passion, moral and civic identity, uh, civic virtue and habit. Too often, uh, I find at least what I call the dumbbell principle approaches. We think of the intellectual over here and the non-cognitive over here, and really they're quite separate. But over and over and over again, we see that the powerful programs that work totally integrate uh, the two. Notre Dame University is a prime example. It puts into practice the stress in its mission statement that Notre Dame seeks to cultivate in its students not only appreciation for the achievements of human, great achievements of human beings, but also a disciplined sense to the poverty, to the injustice, to the oppression that burdens the lives of so many. The aim is to create a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good that will bear fruit as learning becomes service to justice. 
The Academic Code of Honor provides that the university is a community of students, faculty, and administrators who come together to learn, to work, to grow in moral character. And the faculty at Notre Dame do, I think, view the Honor Code as part of their responsibility as community members uh, to be sure it, uh, it works and works uh, uh, well. Central to the concept of a community there is a notion not just of honorable behavior for oneself, but for the community as a whole. Uh, the institution values uh, the community and takes conscious steps to try to enhance uh, the community, particularly in terms of the learning that goes on in the residences, which are integral to the moral life of students <coughs> on the undergraduate level. Uh, there is a Center for Social Concerns, which is a powerful force curricularly and co-curricularly, uh, as are the, the residences. Uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, the third um, uh, point may sound obvious, but I'm struck time and time again how it is ignored. It is simply that the design of curricular and co-curricular programs to promote moral and civic responsibility ought to reflect research on human development in these fields. I'm struck because as academics, we're so careful about our own research and about our own work, but as soon as we are step into the curricular or co-curricular realm, it's as though there wasn't anything there to guide us. But there is an enormous amount of, uh, of learning uh, to draw on. It's one thing, uh, of course, to give students the intellectual capacity to operate uh, as citizens, but it's quite another to offer them engaged experiences that draw out their capacities and really make them operational. To use an analogy that's um, familiar and comfortable in the liberal arts, at least, the platonic view of knowledge is that it's innate, the capacity is there, uh, but absent the prod of some Socratic teaching, the knowledge remains innate, never activated, never realized. So pedagogies of engagement, especially service learning, can serve a liberal education in an analogous way. They can be the clinical experience for the liberal arts, transforming innate capacities for critical thinking and analysis into active forms of civic engagement. Otherwise, the fruits of the liberal education remain in Whitehead's lovely phrase, inert ideas rather than active ones. We saw this over and over again, but maybe most, act, most powerfully at California State University in Monterey Bay, where every student is required to be involved in two service learning courses as a freshman, and the entire undergraduate experience is focused on an explicit set of learning outcomes known as university learning requirements including a capstone which also has a significant uh, uh, service learning dimension. What the university stands for is captured in a vision statement which uh, states a commitment to provide uh, students with critical thinking abilities to be productive citizens and the social responsibility and skills to be community leaders. And that vision statement is posted uh, on virtually every office in the campus, uh, and faculty discussions focus around it and use it as a as a guide. Does this particular requirement meet the the uh, the vision statement? And at a ceremony in which each uh, new faculty and staff member is introduced to the campus, they actually come up and against a large backdrop of the vision statement, actually sign it as a pledge that that is uh, their text. It's a ceremony that reminded me of the one I read about where your freshman uh, uh, signed the honor code and received a pen as a, as a reminder of their commitment to that code. Uh, fourth, the most effective strengthening of moral and civic responsibility among students uh, occurs on campuses where large numbers of curricular and extracurricular learning experiences complement and build on each other. We know that only a small fraction of most undergraduates' time is actually spent in academic work. If you happen to have seen the new uh, National Survey of Student Engagement, it reports that about half of the students say that they spend one hour or less for every class hour. Uh, less than 15% spent two hours for every class hour. So what about the rest of the time? What do they do? Uh, particularly at residential campuses like this one. Unfortunately, very few institutions are very intentional about encouraging students 
to engage in extracurricular programs that really promote moral and civic learning, and particularly about integrating the experience of those programs with their curricular learning. There's substantial evidence uh, that involvement in extracurricular activities is the only valid predictor of success after college, however success is measured, by income or by anything else. Uh, that's a stunning fact to me, so if it surprises you, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, because it, it stunned me when I saw it, read it. Uh, leadership activities are particularly powerful in this uh, realm. And there are a number of institutions, such as Spelman College, that focus very consciously on linking curricular and co-curricular activities and have a high degree of institutional intentionality in regard to ways in which their students can learn outside as well as inside uh, uh, the classroom. And they make a particularly strong effort to relate the freshman core curriculum that they have to a set of co-curricular activities and clubs, each one of which has a faculty uh, advisor who's an active participant, and not just a passive one. Uh, fifth, campus cultures and institutional structures deeply matter. Effective programs for moral and civic learning really do require strong administrative and faculty support. Uh, many good examples of this one, Alverno College uh, is one of them, a small Catholic college for women in Milwaukee, a leader in outcomes-based education for years. Its faculty have been working since the 60s to develop what they call a set of eight abilities that must be demonstrated by graduates. Uh, at each of six levels. Two of those abilities bear directly on moral and civic responsibility. One is called valuing and decision making. The other is called explicitly effective citizenship. And Alverno works to be sure that in each case there is a substantial amount of actual performance uh, in various settings, including community settings, of these abilities at each of uh, the levels. And also, there is a continuing dialogue among faculty about them. Imagine every Friday afternoon, all faculty devote to institutional faculty development and interaction. That's what happens at Alverno. Uh, I won't suggest it could happen uh, uh, here. That's a much smaller place, but it does make an enormous difference. They have a chance to have a continuing discussion of important issues over substantial time. Uh, six and finally, students are encouraged to be civically engaged if they see that their campus and their leaders are active citizens of a larger community. Portland State, a large comprehensive institution in the middle of Portland, is a wonderful example, written across the bridge that joins the two biggest buildings at Portland State is the motto, education serves the community a motto designed and, and uh, even the idea of it was thought up by students. And there's a remarkable range of student uh, teaching, research, service, all directed toward community problems. Uh, administrators and faculty view service to the community as integral to their responsibility in terms of their uh, work. It's built into the tenure, promotion, uh, compensation, hiring standards. I've talked to many community leaders who really believe uh, that those at Portland State are their partners in making a better, stronger community. Well, needless to say, our focus on exemplar institutions uh, shouldn't hide a very disturbing reality, which is that the development of moral and civic character is not on the radar screens of most colleges and universities, except as matters of public relations rhetoric. Uh, it is particularly troubling to us that most undergraduates have very little interest in or understanding of that subset of civic engagement that involves politics. And that reality is uh, particularly disturbing in the wake of the election, and I think that's the right term for it. Um, so I wanted to close with just a few thoughts about higher education's role in grappling with the increasing public dis disinterest even disdain for civic engagement, especially political involvement in this country. 
Uh, the fact that only half of those are eligible to vote and a much smaller share of Generation X uh, uh, voted in the last elections, only the latest evidence. I do have a passionate belief that I hope you share that higher education ought to have important roles in reversing that uh, trend. Uh, but it is a trend, and only somebody from outer space could fail to discern that uh, young people have a uh, widespread lack of interest in civic affairs, particularly political affairs, a lack of trust and respect for uh, the democratic processes. Uh, on college campuses like this one, political discussion has declined. There is a lot of data from freshman surveys indicating the percentage of college freshmen who report frequently discussing politics dropped from a high of 30% in 1968 to 15% in 1995 to an even lower percentage uh, today, uh, just into double digits. Uh, similar decreases were seen in the percentage of those who believe it's important to keep up to date with political affairs or have worked in a political campaign. And that mounting um, evidence bodes very ill for the future of our democracy unless uh, generations of young people do come to see both the value and the necessity for political participation, defined on their own terms, but participation nonetheless. But the literature about uh, Generation X, and I've read, uh, unfortunately, too much of it now, uh, gives me little cause for optimism. Uh, among the best insights I've found, though, is from a book um, by a, a good young friend of mine named George Packer, who wrote a book called Blood of the Liberals that I commend to you. And he put the matter uh, this way. To act politically, you need to believe that political action can achieve something. The children of Vietnam, of Watergate, of the Ford Carter doldrums are more likely to believe that organized politics is a sham. The counterexample of protest politics offers more illusion than substance, a swig of elixir that turns rancid when the world goes on as before. The dramas of the 60s have distorted the years since with a false image, for in most cases, Marching and shouting slogans are completely inadequate to bring about lasting change. But the idea of patiently building a coalition over the years, slowly turning public opinion your way through rational persuasion and electoral struggle, has little appeal when you've never seen it work and you're predisposed to cynicism. There's no independence about the causes of that stat of sad stat of state of affairs. Uh, one of the best, I think, is uh, Bob Putnam and his new book uh, that bears the same uh, name as his article, Bowling Alone, and I commend it to you as well. His analysis leaves a good many important issues uh, unanswered, but it does make clear that the 1900s as a whole were a time when we as a country developed social and political habits that in a virtuous cycle of expanding trust and interaction enabled us to work together more effectively in our communities and as a nation. And at the same time, uh, as Putnam uh, shows over and over again, that increase in measures of social capital, as he calls it, went hand in hand with a growth of tolerance of, and of inclusiveness. Putnam, as those of you who've read his book uh, know, differentiates between what he calls bonding social capital, that which cements uh, among similar individuals and groups, and bridging social capital, the connections woven among disparate groups. And it's the latter, the bridging social capital, that makes civic community work in America. And it's that kind of social capital that's declined sharply uh, since uh, the 70s, following a long period of of uh, growth. For then, uh, starting around 1970, virtually all the measures of social connection and, and civic habits that had developed over the 70 years, including informal connectedness and trust, began a major decline that's continued unabated through the end of uh, the last century to today. And politically, uh, our ability to organize as a nation for citizens to affect their common life by acting conjointly uh, seems to be slipping away. A particularly unsettling reality for us as teachers of young adults, uh, ought to be at least, I think, that Putnam's primary explanation for the decline is what he calls generational change. Well, that's the basis for about half of uh, the decline. 
Viewing every variable relevant to social capital, each generation born since World War II has started lower than the one before and stays lower. Unfortunately, of course, that only reformulates the puzzle. What causes a generational decline? And Putnam isn't clear, though he suggests some causes, and it won't surprise you that one of them, he thinks, is uh, too much TV viewing. Uh, but even within generational cohorts, the more television uh, watching, the less participation in politics, civic life, informal socialization, religious activity, and so forth. It's not that he, as he stresses, that young people don't seek meaning and relationships. It's rather that each succeeding generation has become increasingly feeble at understanding and sustaining relationships. And that trend is, correlates with a worsening report about subjective health and sense of happiness. So we face this strange paradox of an economically successful society compulsively celebrating the idea of individual free agency but one that seems unable to provide its own young people with either meaning or the capacity for loyalty and relationships sufficient to redeem the promise of freedom. When summing up his understanding of our situation, uh, Putnam notes that compared with the much more civic period of the mid-20th century, contemporary American life has heightened our expectations about what we can achieve through choice and grit, thereby leaving us unprepared to deal with life's inevitable failures. Where once we could fall back on social capital, on families, on churches, on friends, these are no longer strong enough to cushion the fall. In our personal lives as well as in our collective life, he concludes, we're paying a significant price for a quarter century's disengagement from one another. The decline of social capital, that is, threatens not only the capacity to act together, but individual well-being itself. I don't suggest that you need to agree with that approach uh, uh, that Bob Putnam spells out or my brief diagnosis of the political scene uh, as seen by young people uh, that follows. But I do stress we need to try to understand the problem before we can contribute much to the solution. This fall ought to have been an explosion of interest in things political uh, among young people particularly. But all the polls I've seen uh, and certainly the anecdotal evidence I've gathered from talking to students suggests absolutely no change in, in the grim picture I, I painted. In the challenge of engaging Generation X in a new realm of uh, politics is daunting. There's a good deal of data that's been gathered by the National Civic League about why young people don't vote, let alone become active in other ways in politics. And that data makes clear that the reason is not that they are apathetic. Far from being apathetic, they're angry. They're angry because they perceive that politics today is controlled by money, that as a result, an individual citizen can't make much difference in the political arena. In 1996, uh, $250 million was spent in soft money in campaigns. In the last election, it was, national election, it was more than doubled. Even a local campaign can cost millions of dollars, and young people know, or at least they think they know, which is kind of the same thing uh, for them, that those who give the millions will expect returns on their investments. So Generation X uh, concludes that just as their $5 or even $50 contribution can't make much difference in a campaign that spends millions, so their votes won't make much difference either. And un understandably, that sad state of affairs makes them very angry at politicians as well as those who pay for the campaigns. And young people see these realities with particular clarity because, uh, as George Packer wrote, they don't remember anything else. They don't remember an era when politics and the environment surrounded it were different. The explosive emergence of globalism really adds a new dimension with internet capacity to reach around the, the world instantly, creating uh, so-called global electronic communities. Uh, many young people ask why it's important to be connected at all to my geographic community. I'm talking now to, uh, to Berlin. Who cares about South Durham? Uh, those who do have a strong sense of personal responsibility for their local community may well feel it's enough to, if they meet it by individual volunteer service, service uh, that's actually been on the rise for some time. In short, uh, many young people simply don't buy the theory that they should engage in political affairs. They're convinced they can't make a difference in that realm. They think politics is a sham, that the only issue is power, and it is for sale to the highest bidder. 
They do want to affect change. They're particularly eager to do so now. They're impatient to do so. They volunteer for activities in the community when they can see and feel and touch and know the results personally. So they tutor kids. They help in community kitchens. They work to clean up parks. But they usually don't link their individual community work to the efforts of others or, more troubling, seek to translate their community concerns into permanent change in public policy through the only vehicle, vehicle available in our democracy, which is, of course, politics. And as a result of these forces and others, our civic muscles have atrophied from lack of use, um, and in terms of young people, from uh, no use at all, uh, just as an arm atrophies uh, from being in a cast too long. And practice is needed before it can return to its full potential. Uh, and that is particularly true for, for young people. They especially need help from institutions that can teach the deliberative skills, the habits of thought uh, and heart necessary for real politics. Campuses like this one should, in my view, take the lead. The task of preparing Generation X and its successors in, to engage in politics defined in ways that meet their own concerns and interests, not ours but theirs, requires leadership from institutions of higher education like this one because those institutions are the most closely linked uh, to these generations. Particularly through their faculties, uh, those institutions need to educate students in the values, the skills, the knowledge needed for democracy. And the leaders of the institutions need to ensure that both they and their campuses are models of good citizenry. And that has been a special focus of my attention over the past uh, uh, couple of years. Uh, in our Carnegie project, uh, my colleagues and I have seen some really good examples of curricular and co-curricular programs designed to engage students in politics. Not a lot, but some. More encouraging, uh, we discerned increasing interest among faculty members to help meet the problem. To cite one of the more ambitious uh, examples, Tufts University is now planning a College of Citizenship and Public Service as a large uh, gift to support it, fortunately. The college program will include freshman seminars, honors programs, community partnerships, grants for students and faculty projects, numerous forums. And increased public understanding and engagement are the explicit goals of the college. On a more modest level, there are a number of clusters of courses, such as the one at, uh, at Swarthmore in the Department of Political Science called the Democracy Project where a three-course cluster is organized to deepen students' understanding and commitment to democracy um, through participation in community work. Uh, it's led by a professor of democratic theory and practice. It focuses on case studies of democracy and practice and the integration of theory and practice through internships and community service. Another example is a cluster of courses at the University of Michigan, one of which uh, you may have read about called Contemporary Issues in, in American Politics, uh, read because an uh, uh, interesting experiment took place there uh, by two faculty members, one from Harvard, one from uh, Michigan, who taught the course uh, in four sections, uh, one of which was a service learning section. The other uh, three were not the service learning, all in service related to uh, contemporary politics in, uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, the group to do the service learning section was chosen at random. Um, at the end of uh, the course, uh, they did the uh, this. They did this uh, over two successive years. Uh, they found uh, on three scales that uh, students in the community service learning sections uh, succeeded more than their classmates. Uh, their grades were better by blind grading. They reported higher satisfaction in their course evaluations, and their awareness of political and social problems was greater as measured by, uh, by a questionnaire. And there are a number of other such studies, um, none quite as neat as that one, I think, but uh, much more uh, broad-based in terms of many thousands of students over many hundreds of institutions that go to the same point. And my own teaching these days is focused on promoting civic learning by linking uh, the study of what it means to be a responsible citizen to active participation in civic projects. 
In the process, I think students do come to understand that they can make a difference in public policy, that they can develop the skills and knowledge needed to, to make the kinds of policy changes they need, and then to be effective uh, in helping to implement uh, those changes, but only if they're willing to engage in politics, often in very new forms. And I know that's uh, the aim of a number of efforts uh, here at Duke, particularly through the Sanford Institute. My own experiences in the classroom uh, persuade me that civic responsibility is not just a dimension of learning that can be pasted on a student's character while she or he learns calculus. It is really a complex combination of cognitive and emotional learning. But I am convinced that uh, those who claim it has no place in an undergraduate curriculum are wrong, and dangerously so. There are risks, of course, uh, but those risks, I think, pale in, in, into insignificance compared to the dangers of not, uh, not trying to engage each succeeding generation of young people in the important work of democracy. Uh, for now, I do stress I'm optimistic. I have to be. Um, it has been a commonplace, I know, to bemoan the lack of civic responsibility among young people, to urge increased attention to moral and civic education at every level. If the issue were simply uh, one of information transfer from my head to theirs or your head to theirs, uh, the role of higher education would be inevitably a modest one. And uh, the same really is true if it were solely one of proselytizing students uh, uh, to pay attention to politics. But like those who established and those who support the Keenan Center, I do have much more in mind. With John Dewey, I do believe that democracy and education, like moral and civic and uh, cognitive learning, are inexorably intertwined, not simply because Citizenry must be educated to deal honestly with each other, to choose responsibly our political leaders, to hold them accountable. But much more important, because a democratic society is one in which, in which citizens must interact with each other, must learn from each other, must grow with each other, and together make their communities more than the sum of their parts. And to help translate that goal into effective educational programs is our common task and we dare not fail. Thank you so much for letting me be with you. If, if we have time for uh, comments, uh, criticisms, rejoinders, even compliments, whatever, I'd be, uh, I'd be delighted. Would you like to handle your own question? Sure, unless you want to do it. Uh, anyone have a, are you awake? Awake out there? Yes? Thoughts? Yes, sir. The, uh, uh, actually, I've given your voice today. But <laughs> no, uh, helpful. Thank you. Uh, this, not working? Yeah. Okay. Um, the examples that you gave early on of Alverno or Turtle Mountain or Notre Dame, uh, these are both in, these are institutions that are particularist in different ways. And also, although Notre Dame more of an exception, not as much of a research university. Uh, perhaps some of the examples you gave at the end of, uh, of Michigan uh, are, are more appropriate. But what I'm most puzzled by is what applies from a lot of these examples, particularly when you outline the six major points you wanted to make in the examples you gave to an institution like Duke, which is far more pluralist, or, or perhaps put differently, far more individualist. Uh, and has such an uh, obvious stress on the question of research, which seems in some ways to be at loggerheads with the much larger uh, mission that you're, you're defining. Uh, fair point. And the reality is, I tried to say um, uh, gently but firmly, I do think Duke is in the lead. And I do think it is harder at a research university uh, where faculty as a whole view themselves as independent contractors whose allegiance is more toward their discipline, if there's any allegiance at all, than it is toward their campus. Uh, I'm not convinced it is uh, solely or even primarily because of, of a research focus. And indeed, I think that can be turned uh, around. Um, and these days, uh, for better or worse, uh, it's very hard to find a campus that doesn't say it has a significant research dimension to it. Um, a lot of it is for worse, I would, would add. 
but rather because uh, it's hard to create a campus culture. Uh, and I think you have to work hard at developing a sense of community and a sense of culture when faculty as a whole view themselves as, I, I use the term, independent contractors. Uh, and that is why I think, uh, frankly, uh, Duke is far ahead of Stanford in its sense uh, for undergraduates of a community in which moral and civic issues are there to be dealt with. And uh, I've heard enough students and faculty over the course of um, my wanderings here <coughs> who will say, that's not true for me and it's not true for my this group of students that, to, to be readily aware that it's, uh, this is not universal. Uh, this is not Messiah College where you sign on to a, a, a statement of faith uh, as part, and there is a, uh, somebody upstairs watching you. Uh, but still, um, uh, Noah is absolutely right that, uh, uh, and, and Notre Dame has, has uh, uh, the Catholic Church too. But having said that, I'm watching at Michigan, where the president cares uh, uh, at uh, Minnesota, which has launched a major effort on civic engagement that relates to every aspect of the curriculum and co-curriculum and relations with uh, the institution uh, as deeply part of its uh, uh, commitment. So I don't think it's, uh, and, and is making the research enterprise very much part of that in the same way that you have built research into service learning and so many other dimensions. So I don't think it's the research itself. It is the faculty sense of, uh, well, lack of sense of community that's, uh, that's the challenge. Yes? It seems to me that, uh, can you hear me? It seems to me that, uh, it's important what we're doing in higher education, but the grades 1 to 12 seem to be a, an extremely important period of time of developing what you want to do in the higher education, what we want to do in higher education. Is there anything being done in the context of age 1 <coughs> to 12 that uh, can help to develop what's happening in higher education? Uh, the answer is there are a lot of things going on, and, uh, and I don't pretend, pretend to know all of them. I'm much involved with two organizations that are working particularly to promote uh, civic understanding and engagement among K-12 students, one uh, from the Center on Civic uh, um, Education in, in California uh, produces a large lots of materials for kindergarten through high school. Uh, and ways in which students can help to uh, learn uh, and be actively engaged in civic and moral uh, issues. At the same time, I think uh, your question raises a particularly good opportunity for those of us in higher education who uh, are living with uh, the unfortunate uh, bifurcation of our uh, forebearers from K-12 into, quote, higher education because uh, there are lots of opportunities and some of them are being implemented right here at Duke for students, undergraduates to learn and then turn around and teach what they learn uh, to those in high school or in, uh, in, in uh, even lower grades. And I've seen that in something called Project Durham uh, in very exciting ways where students, a group of students uh, uh, have a... Um, Somebody here will correct me when I make a mistake here, but I have a handspring, uh, like a Palm Pilot on a handspring, with all the uh, demographic data from, uh, from Durham in uh, the last century on it, and uh, doing research and then also teaching in the Durham schools about, uh, and Aristotle said that there's no better way to learn than to teach, and a lot of other people have said since him, uh, but it's true, and there's another one of the many ways in which there are connections. The University of Minnesota has an enormously active program uh, in the uh, K-12 schools in Minnesota. The University of Pennsylvania has another one. So I think there are terrific opportunities for linkages 
so both undergraduates and K-12 can learn and learn together. Elizabeth. Um, I was struck, I think, that one of the most challenging aspects of, of your argument in the lecture and in your work elsewhere has been drawing the link between moral, the moral and the civic, mm -hmm. and, and especially explicitly in your lecture today, to explicitly political action, action in the larger polity. And I just wanted to ask you, I mean, how would you respond to the view, which is, a, of course, a very long-standing one, and I'm thinking of everything from you know, the Italian humanists and others who have said, and I, I was thought of this particularly when you said young people are not apathetic, they're angry. There has, there's a long-standing tradition of people saying, the world is a corrupt place, and I will cultivate my garden, I will do good things in my own context. Um, I will try to be a decent person. I will uh, you know, tutor, let's say if I'm involved in a larger community, I'll be involved one-on-one, -on -one, but I will ignore the larger world because it's too corrupt uh, to, to make any difference. And, and I think your challenge, you're, you're, you are challenging us to say that there is something incomplete about a kind of moral Absolutely. commitment that doesn't go all the way up to looking at how ought we to live as a larger polity. But how would you respond to that? That you can be a decent person, but you can't be a whole person. You can't be a whole person except as part of a community. And a campus is particularly uh, appropriate learning experience to be part of a community. Uh, which, for better or worse, most of our students are going to be parts of some community. And it's very hard, in, in this life at least, to simply isolate oneself completely. You have to depend on others, interact with others, and ideally take joy in that interaction and take joy in the pleasure of giving to others <coughs> who have something, uh, who, who need something that you can, can do. And part of the learning process is that. Uh, there are some who have said today, uh, Benjamin Barber is one who says, let's teach the civic skills and it really has nothing to do with, with moral values. But I think that's um, a very corrosive of, uh, of the texture of our democracy in the sense that democracy means very much learning to live together as a community, interact with each other, grow together, <coughs> expand together, and make our community whole much more than a group of isolated individual hermits, each doing her own thing. Not an easy lesson to learn, particularly if we don't follow it in our lives, and as was suggested earlier, for many of us as faculty members, much of our lives are spent in, in splendid isolation. So it's a challenge. I don't, don't question that. Other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I thought what you had to say about uh, students uh, cynicism about politics and relate, relating it to their um, view of the money in politics and their inability to make a dent in the, with, it, with their level of contribution financially. Has anybody really tried to measure the extent to which this is important? to young people today an important deterrent to their participation? National Civic League has done a lot of data gathering about what young people think. Uh, and uh, the Pew Foundation has supported a whole series of uh, projects. And um, I, it, it's too simple to say that they think it's just about power. Nothing more than power. Who has the power and who exercises it and money is behind the power. Uh, but there is a very substantial thread of that that runs through all the data I've seen. Um, but I would commend the National Civic League as, as uh, the, the best source of, of uh, more or less impartial data that I've seen. But I don't know, sometimes I think all oh, politics is about power and money, and so it's hardly surprising that they do too, but I just have to get up in the morning and say, no, I'm going to try to make it better. Yes? Um, when we were talking about the deterrence to community and engagement and participation, um, I thought about two screens, and one screen you mentioned, which is the television screen, and it's very easy to say, oh, well, they shouldn't do that, that's a good waste of time. Um, whether, you know, it has any effect. But the other screen uh, is one that we value and use more and more, and that's the computer screen. And 
I think it's a very isolating device, uh, despite chat rooms and whatever else they say. But you didn't mention that. Is that a, a, a help or a hindrance? Uh, uh, I'm, I, I basically think it goes in, in more the same direction than the reverse, although you're saying it has a tremendous potential for interaction that is much more difficult in, in television. Um, you read a book and you think of all those things, but it, it, uh, when you watch the screen, it, it doesn't happen. And using the uh, computer, it uh, has powerful interactive dimensions, but still it, very isolating in lots of ways without uh, the supplement or complement of coming together periodically. So I haven't seen it, and I don't think there is yet enough evidence to tell us the answer, but I'm afraid it's going in the wrong direction too. Oh, yes, sir. This is a difficult question to keep from being misunderstood. Uh, and the question is, if you encountered uh, examples of theology or God being reintroduced into the curriculum, and let me restate that a little differently. Uh, monotheism uh, can serve as an ordering principle or unifying principle for the individual and the society. But we know that theocracies have gone in an undemocratic way. Are there, are there ways of reintroducing God into the intellectual life in the curriculum uh, in, in a uh, PC, politically correct way would be to introduce theology into the curriculum? Have you encountered uh, you let, uh, successes? I think, I think the answer is uh, definitely yes. Um, but let me start with the co-curricular. And remember I said that the biggest single determinant of, quote, success, however defined as co-curricular activity. Many institutions, I think, don't take adequate advantage, and I will say Indiana was one of them where we had 34 different uh, uh, faith-based organizations. I don't think we took enough advantage of their ability to enhance the moral learning of our students uh, and link that to the curriculum. Uh, in a public institution, we're not going to teach uh, theology. We are going to teach about religion. Private institutions can have uh, uh, the ability to do that. But I'm still not clear that it isn't more effective as part of the co-curriculum. But there certainly are many courses at Notre Dame uh, or Messiah College where uh, uh, there are tough analysis, uh, analysis of sections in the Gospels, uh, but students come away with a strengthened sense of faith. Uh, whatever your, your judgment of the value of that, I've seen it work in, in powerful ways to enhance the much more general uh, moral compass of the students involved. Does that uh, respond to your question? Final thought. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, you mentioned, um, or you suggested to add, um, you suggested to add um, uh, civic learning courses and so forth, civic education courses to the curriculum, to the regular curriculum. Also, another effort, I think, has been um, with regard to admitting students as freshmen Absolutely. to um, to ask for civic engagement yeah. prior uh, to, to enter the university and so forth. My question is, um, with regard to, the, to these additional requirements, how confident are you that students will actually internalize the, the values that um, you aim to teach these, these people, rather than just see all these additional requirements as just that, an additional requirement to get ahead in life. Okay, I take another course in civic education. Okay, I, I'll be a little bit active in Europe, so I can you know, uh, get an education. Where, where do you see um, this family? Threshold point, I'm glad you mentioned, mentioned admissions because I do think it's uh, an absolutely powerfully important pivot point and the admissions office in this university has had a significant impact, I think, 
on student life uh, over the last five years, to its great credit, I would say. Uh, in terms of your uh, main point, I didn't make myself clear, and I apologize for that. I didn't mean to suggest adding on, slapping on three more requirements on top of an existing curriculum. I meant to say, uh, today you have uh, many courses that teach moral philosophy, other courses that teach uh, about American politics. Infusing enough of those with the values, skills, and knowledge so that students can develop their own moral compass and civic compass to operate, not to have a, uh, I, I don't think it can work to, uh, to inculcate those in some ways, and particularly if the students see it as just slapped on, on top, but rather uh, infused as part of the existing ongoing effort. And I think that's uh, in exactly what I tried to do in the requirement now that students take two courses in ethical inquiry without saying uh, those courses have to uh, ensure that students come away with a particular set of values. If you did that, it would be a formula, I think at least, for disaster. Thank you again very much. I'm going to be around for a while, and if you have more questions.